Welcome to Unforbidden Truth. I'm Andrew. This is part two of my interview with convicted serial killer William Holbert, aka Wild Bill. What did the trials look like for you and Laura while they were going on? Well, that's actually pretty funny. They tried to take me to a trial a couple of times. Um, but well, first of all, I'm confessed. I'm a person who confessed to the crime I'm guilty. So my trial, you would think, would be very fast and over with and easy. And it took me seven years to get to a trial in Panama, even though I was confessed. The things, the, there's only there's two, two speeds of justice in the Republic of Panama, slow and very slow. And so I, it's just really difficult here. People stay in jail for years. Like, like you get a guy that stole something small and he's in jail for five years. And when he goes to trial, it, they find him guilty and give him a two-year sentence, but he's in, been in prison five years, you know? And so, I mean, it's really a, really a difficult situation, the, 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 the whole. When I went to the trial, there were, it took three times for them to get their stuff together. And not, not me, because, I mean, I was easy. I was ready to go to trial. You know, I mean, it's easy. Mine was easy. But it took the, the government three times to get everybody together, three, t- three, three attempts to get everybody. The first time, there's a whole bunch of press there, like a lot of international press. The second time, there was less. And the third time, when it actually happened, it was just local press, which is really a blessing in a way. It wasn't such a big thing. And it's kind of funny. I think I did. I, I do a lot of things. I'm a lot different than everybody, I think. And, and I realize that. Like, most people just go with the flow or whatever. But so I went into the trial and, and uh, there, you know, the, all the, there was me, uh, Michelle was there with her lawyer, and my, I was there with my lawyer. We were sitting on one side. On the other side, there was uh, uh, the fiscal, what is the district attorney. And then some uh, representative of one of the victims. And that, that representative was only asking for, for uh, goods, like property and stuff. He wasn't asking for, like, he didn't come to, you know, to say nothing about me. I, he came to try to get back some property. Anyway, three judges, three judges, uh, a chief judge and two, two, like, helper judges. I don't know what the words are. Anyway, associate judge. So the trial starts, and, and the judge tells me I'm going to be there eight hours. And he's like, I got to be here eight hours? I asked. And my lawyer's like, shut up. I'm like, I, I don't want to be here eight hours. I'm guilty. And so the district attorney starts talking and telling me what a horrible person I am and how I'm a monster and blah, 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 blah. And I mean, don't get me wrong. I don't want to be, I don't want to be callous. He's right. He, how can I say that he's not right? He's right. But at the same time, I don't really want to sit here and listen to that. I'm guilty. I'm in prison. The worst things of the thing, the worst thing they can do to me has already occurred. So why do I have to sit here and listen to that idiot, that idiot politician fool, buffoon, talk for eight hours about me. So I told that, I, saw, I said that to the judge, I don't want to be here eight hours listening to him scream, say bad things about me. I'm guilty. There's no reason I have to be here. In prison, I'm the representative of, in the, in the this was in the old David jail, in a jail that doesn't exist anymore, a prison that doesn't exist anymore. But in that time period, I was the representative of the, of the prisoners to the government. And I said, hey man, I got a job in prison. I'm somebody in prison. Here I ain't nobody. Let me go back to prison. You guys figure out what you want to do with me. And, they, and the judge laughed and he's like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah, I'm serious. because I don't want to be here in this trial. I mean, and I felt like my presence in the trial was detrimental to Laura Michelle and her chances to get out of prison. And that's another reason I did it. And I said, I'm ready to go back home. And my lawyer's like, are you crazy? I'm like, well, I mean, but what, what good am I going to do here? I read a statement saying that I'm guilty and I apologize to the American people. I apologize to the the people of Thailand because there's a, a Thai lady and I apologize to the Republic of Panama. What else can I do? What else? Well, I mean, what other good thing can I do other than have to just sit here in this cold air conditioning? You know, it was like really cold for eight hours. And and the judge laughed and he said, "Okay, well, I wish all the trials were like this." And I'm like, "Well, hey man, I'm your man. Send me, get me out of here." And so they sent me back to, to the prison, and that was it. In the prison, in W, you haven't asked, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you. In the prison, in W, the I ran the prison, and when I say I ran the prison, I mean I, I really ran that prison from 2013 and 2000 to 2016 when it closed, 2017 when it closed. And I worked in the security office with the head of security, the head guard, and it was my job to make to, to maintain order within the, within the gangs inside the prison. It was a great job, a wonderful job. I was so happy doing that job. In 2013, I converted to Christianity completely, wholeheartedly. And I know that a lot of you, the people who are listening to this are people who are probably not at all Christians. And, and I also know that a lot, of, a lot of people think badly about Christians, especially in the United States, because of how judgmental and how, how they, they see them like stick in the mud kind of people. But, but real Christians are not like that. Real Christians love 
and I loved my job and, and I really enjoyed helping people. And like, uh, we had a drive to get people, um, that had tuberculosis. There's like 20 guys that had tuberculosis just dying. I mean, guys are going to die from that. We got them cured. We got them cured. We had people from the States come and come down and actually administer treatment to them. And, 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 and I did that. And so that was good. And, and, and in the prison, like there'd be a riot or something. And I would have to go and be the, 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 the one that goes on the, to talk to the two, two gangs and say, Hey, you know, like, you guys can't make any money if you're fighting. We know how it all works here. Everything's contraband. And so if you guys are fighting, how are we going to, how, how, how are you going to bring contraband in to sell? How are you, I mean, you know, it's just all locked down to, you know, like and try and try to use psychology, but not just psychology, but the truth to get them to, to, to stop killing one another. And uh, it was just a great job. I really loved it. I woke up every day at five o'clock in the morning. I boxed and I worked out in the morning with a boxing instructor, a guy who was actually put in prison, who was a boxer put in prison, taught me how to box. And that's another thing I just have a passion about. I love to box and I'm old and fat, but, uh, but, but I'm really good. And, and the kids here, I got kids half my age and I'm, my record was, well, it was, I don't have a record anymore because I don't really fight anymore, but, but my record in, in the, in the old jail was eight and one. I lost the first fight I ever fought because I didn't know what I was doing. And I started training and I never lost another fight. So it was really great. And, and, and those are things that you do in prison to try to make things go. Now, Panamanian prison runs completely on contraband. Everything's on contraband. Um, anything that you want in a Panamanian prison, you can find. Here they kill each other with guns. Where I am, it's extremely violent. This is a new place where right? they've sent. So in like 2018, I think it was, or 2019, I'm not sure which year, um, I did an interview with the Daily Mirror, and they promised me, they swore to me, that they would not show me on a video call. And I said, okay. So the lady says, the lady that's doing the interview says, well, I'm going to call you on a video call, but we're not going to show it. I just want to make sure that uh, you're really you. And I said, okay. So I called and I talked to her about like 20 minutes. And then they published the video call. So thermonuclear hell breaks out for me in prison. The, the, the prison officials are like, why are you talking to the press on a, on a cell phone, on a, on a, on a video phone call. I mean, like, you know, if you're talking to the press, you could be talking to the press on a, on a phone, on a phone on the wall, you know, like a pay phone, like this interview. But, but if you're talking on a, on a, on a, on a, on a cell phone, like a video phone call, it's pretty obvious that you're using contraband in prison. And so the, the prison authorities, and also the interview was very, very negative towards the prison because they were abusing some poor prisoners. You know, so, when I say poor prisoners, I don't mean like poor prisoners. I mean economically challenged prisoners. They were abusing them terribly, and um, and and so I brought that to light. And I was we were trying to get some international help from the the UN, which is the most worthless organization that ever existed, and they should all be fired because they don't do they do nothing at all. Um, and and we're trying to get some people to come in from the UN and, and do an inspection, which say that's don't ever believe anything that the UN says because they're just a you know, um, so, so they, they punished me and they sent me to where I am now. This is a punishment area. And, and they made them, I think it's a mistake because they threw in, they threw, it's like throwing the rabbit into the, into the, into the briar patch, you know, uh, here I was in a place in minimum security. I was in a minimum security prison. I was very comfortable, but they put me into the place here where I'm not comfortable at all. I'm very uncomfortable, but the people are all monsters and and they look to me as 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 their leader so i'm at a church here as i had already as i had been doing before already and and we've had a really successful church and and one of the things i'm really proud of is that where i am since i started the church in in february of last year uh, february of 2020 not one person has killed anybody not one person has stabbed anybody. Um, they, there's a lot of drug use and a lot of illegal contraband and things like that. But, but, but really, it's really making a difference. In 2019, in the end of 2019, there was a massacre here where 15 were killed and they chopped off heads like something out of a movie. They chopped off heads and held them up for trophies. 15 were killed with AK-47s and machetes. And I mean, just all hell broke loose. You can look it up on. You can look it up and read about it. Uh, it was a massacre in La Jolla. That's where I am. And um, all those guys that did the killing actually are in the are in the in the the building right beside me here. Like we can see them through the, the what we call the fishbowl. There's a fishbowl here where there's cops. The cops are in the fishbowl, and on the other side of the fishbowl, there's another patio like this patio where we are. And so they killed. 
fifteen AK forty sevens prisoner prisoners with AK forty sevens against prisoners. Um, you may see that's insane. Well, it's true. I don't care what you want here. You can get whatever you want. This is super maximum prison. And the other day, listen, this is what happened the other day in, in, in patio two in Pavion two, I'm sorry, cell block two, cell block two. Some kids climbed up over the wall, one side down to the other side and, and shot them, shot and shot to death, uh, a couple of prisoners there. And so we were really sad that, that happened. Um, in my in my cell block, nobody kills anybody. We 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 made that pact. We made a, a peace pact. I've, I've learned these things in my years. We get all the heads of the gangs together and right. We make a we make an agreement. We understand that you guys want to sell dope. You guys want to sell dope. And everybody's fighting over who can sell dope. But let's let everybody sell dope and nobody kill anybody. I mean, that's the best we can do. And here we're in hell where we are. Um, resocialization here or rehabilitation is nothing that doesn't exist it does not exist there's not one person that works here i'm the only, I'm the, i run the church and i don't get any credit for that i just do that because i want to um there's no rehabilitation of any kind there's no no anti-drug program there's no and and that's not true of all panama's prisons but i'm talking about the prison where i am this is the one what needs it the most this is the one where all the criminals like you get a guy you get a kid that comes in here for something petty and when he leaves, he's got a couple of H's, a couple of homicides under his belt, and he's ready to go to the street and kill now. He was robbing before, but now he's ready to go to the street and kill. Now he's angry. And so, I mean, we have a real problem here. Um, and, and a lot of people say to me, well, who are you? Who are you to try to tackle the problem you being a killer and all that stuff? And, and, and my, my, my response is, I have a couple of different responses, but, but, but one, I, if you're a Christian, Moses, Murder was a murderer and became the became the the, the human savior of, of the children of Israel. Uh, David murdered his best friend to sleep with his wife, uh, and and became king of Israel. Um, Paul was was originally called Saul and was a Christian murderer. He murdered Christians. That's what he did for a living. That was his job. And so so it's not about where we've been. It's about where we're going. Where are we going? Where are you going? Where am I going? It's not about what's happened to us or the things that we've done. It's about what are we doing with today and where are we going tomorrow? And so, and that's what we preach here in prison, trying to give some people uh, self-esteem because one of the biggest problems that you have with prisoners is they have low self-esteem. They think that they're shit and, and they can't be anything more than just a, you know, a gangbanger. That's the only thing they can be. And so the church, our church, tries to instill a little bit of enthusiasm in them. Like, you're, you're such an important person that Jesus Christ died for you. God came and died for you. You're so important, you know? And, and, and why would you do these terrible things when somebody loves you so much that he would do that for you? And so, so what we want to do is to bring people their self-esteem up and realize that, hey, I'm really worth something and I don't have to be a screw-up. You know, I can be somebody in my life. I'm going to get a second chance. Even I... Sooner or later, even I, one way or another, will get a second chance. Uh, so that's a long response to a short question. After you and Lori were convicted, you received a 47-year prison sentence, and she received a 26-year prison sentence. How did you feel when not only yourself but Laura, both of you, were handed down your sentences? Well, I thought I really thought she'd go free. I stood up in court and said she didn't do anything, and there was no evidence against her. One of the reasons that she didn't go free is because the excellent American government came and stuck their nose in the thing and 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 tried to make sure that we would never get out of prison. Um, there were three Americans killed, uh, the only one of which would who you would call an innocent person would be poor Cheryl Hughes. Um, the other two were both criminals like myself. And I don't, but anyway, so the Americans came and were angry with, 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 with Bill and me. And um, and they they made sure that that everybody got punished, and, and and that's what happened. We appealed, Laura and I both appealed. My appeal came back, and they gave me one year off, forty six. And then I don't I don't know about hers. I don't I don't know. I really don't know. Her she's she I, I don't speak to her anymore, and so I don't know. But I hope that I hope she gets out soon. Even if she doesn't get, even if she doesn't get her sentence, you don't do but about half your time in Panama, so she should be eligible for parole in a year or two. And she's working. So the last I heard from her, anyway, she's working. And, and I think all the girls work. And when you're allowed to work, you're allowed to work, they give you time off for that, too. So 
So I don't think that she, she's got another year or two in prison and she's gone. Has she been in touch with you about how, how the prison is there, what the living conditions are like? You know, is she be, being treated it's fair? It's a lot yeah. better. The, thank God, too. Thank God. They treat the women a lot better than they treat the men. Although the women are very violent as well. How many women are very violent as well. And they cut each other in the faces with, with razor blades and stuff. But, but their actual living situation is a lot more, a lot more relaxed. And, and that's good. You know, it should be. Do you feel that you and Laura both received fair trials? Okay. Panamanian law. Okay. I, I want to be really clear about what I really think. As a Christian male, what do I think the, the sentence for five homicides should be? I think they should have taken me out back and put me against the wall and shot me. That would have been the correct sentence. Now, that's moral. I said, I don't want that to happen. I'm not saying I want that to happen, but I'm asking, you're asking me an honest question. I'm giving you an honest answer. I think that people who kill people should be killed. Do I think that she received a fair trial? Certainly not. And in no, in no form, there was no evidence against her. And the only witness against her was me who said, she didn't do anything, let her go. So, so that was really a sad thing and, and was just a purely, purely politically motivated move because the, the, the Panamanians danced to whatever Uncle Sam says, I mean, this is like a, the 51st state. They do whatever the gringos say. And, and the American government, that's uh, so another thing I'd like to mention on here. The Ameri- uh, under, I'm, I'm, I was a, not necessarily a Trump fan, but between Trump and Hillary Clinton, I would have went with Trump, right? But, but I want to be real honest about something. The, 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 the embassy was so hateful and terrible under Donald Trump and under uh, um, Obama the embassy was so loving and caring. They came to see me every three months, even though I, even though I'm this terrible murderer. They, they they made sure I was okay. They fought for my for my. I really got used to that. I used, I got used to having this weapon I, as a prisoner. I had this weapon. The embassy came every three months and, and made them treat me very well. Made me do what made them do what I wanted them to do. And then when Trump took over, like the embassy hated prisoners. And so I'm I'm waiting right now. I've sent letters to the embassy now. The embassy is required by law to see me every three months and check on me and make sure I'm not dead or something. I haven't seen the embassy in over two years, like two and a half years. I, the last time I saw the embassy before I actually got married, I'm, I'm married again now to the most wonderful woman in the world. And before I got married, I, the embassy came to, to try to give me a passport so that I could get married and give me an identification so that I could get married. And and that was the last time I saw anybody from the U.S. Consul Embassy. And this is way before COVID. We're talking a long time before COVID, a year and a half before COVID shut Panama down. So the embassy under Donald Trump is, is garbage, man. They don't, they're just not doing anything for U.S. citizens. And not just me in prison. I've read about it in, in other ways, too. That, that really, that was a shame. It was a shame that, 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 that they have done that. And so we're really waiting now to see what will happen under Biden. Um, it's funny. It's incredible when you realize how... Something is in what it seems insignificant, like who is the president, can really actually affect you. Um, and, it, and it really did affect me in that way. Trump's, Trump's people were crap, and not only crap, they were hateful, like they, they wanted to see you in pain. And, and like, and Obama's people were very humanitarian. While you were in jail on trial for the five homicides, what was your experience like? Were you being treated right or, you know, were you in PC due to your high profile status at the time? No. Um, but first, the first year I was here in Panama City. The first year I was here in Panama City in La Joyita, in, in a jail that's, that's in the same complex where I am now, but it's a, it's a different jail, but it's in the same complex. There's 15,000 people in prison where I am, and there's three jails. There's three prisons inside there. Each one has about 5,000 men. In there, I, I was in a very high-profile area. Hey, man, I'm telling you, there was booze, drugs. There were girl, ladies from the police, lady, lady sergeants that would come and have sex with the prisoners for 100 bucks. Um, you know, it was just it was like being at a big party. Then I went, I was transferred from here to the David facility. It's spelled David, but they say it David. David facility, in which it took me three years to really understand how it works. I, I got there, and... And I was like butting heads with the authorities because I didn't understand what they wanted from me and what they, all they wanted from me was money. And I didn't understand it. I, I, I mean, it was such a different system. I didn't understand it and I didn't have any money anyway. And so by the time I organized the, then, then, then after like three years of really having a hard time being locked in a lot and being on in solitary confinement, I accepted Jesus Christ and, and I changed the way that I looked at the situation and then the situation changed. 
strange. This is a Wayne Dyer quote, who's not a Christian, uh, who said, if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And it's really true. I stopped looking at them as enemies and took responsibility for the horrible things that I've done in my life and, and actually started trying to help people. And like a lot of good things happened. Man. And so within a short period of time after that, I was in charge of the prison, literally like, like I had the key to my own cell and I would open the cell at five o'clock in the morning, go to work and close myself in about midnight and get five hours worth of sleep and then back at it again the next day. And, and I didn't have a key to the gate to like leave the prison, but that the only thing I could, I went to work with a suit with a, with a shirt and tie on and work with the girls in the office. And so, I mean, like the only thing I couldn't do when I was in the David facility between 2013 or 2014 and 2017, when it closed was leave. I couldn't leave. But other than that, there was nothing I couldn't do. I ate, I ate food from the street every day. Um, but I worked, I really worked hard too. I, I, it's not like I just, I was there like live, lamming it up. You know, I, I worked really hard to try to maintain the peace there. Then they built a new facility and I still wasn't condemned. Still wasn't, uh, uh, I didn't have a condena, uh, a sentence. I didn't have a sentence yet. And then, then they built a new facility. When I went to the new facility, a lot of those freedoms were taken away because the new facility was designed to, well, it was designed for that purpose to be a little bit more secure. And because a lot of people were escaping from the other prison. Could I have escaped? A million times I could have escaped, and, and I never did. And, and then people say, well, why don't you escape? And I'm like, what the hell am I going to do if I escape? I'm famous. Where am I going to go? I got no money. I mean, what am I going to do? Go back and kill people again? No way, man. I mean, I want to get out right. I want to do the things right. I want to pay my debts. I really have a faith in Jesus Christ enough that I know that if I do the right thing long enough, sooner or later something is going to happen for me, too. And so. So that's what that's what I'm trying to do now. But like I, when I was in the the old jail facility, the old facility, literally there was a piece of tin roof between me and Chris. I cut a hole in the tin roof with a, with a, with, a, with a pocket knife. I could have climbed out and, and escaped because there's no. I was in an area. I, I wasn't even in a jail cell. I was in a room. I had an air conditioned room. It was my, it was my, and that's like that's like where, where all the, the big high rollers live there, you know. So then they built a new facility, which is much more secure. I mean, we closed the old jail, and um, we went there, and it was a, wasn't as much, it wasn't as good. And, and the, but then they moved me to this new facility, which is terrible. It's really difficult. Um, you can have a visit one time a month, and it's behind glass, and there's not even a phone to talk. You can just see one another. You can't actually speak. You scream at one another between behind glass. And this has been the hardest thing because I married a beautiful woman. Uh, she's 25 years old now. She was 23 when we got married. Beautiful young woman. We had everything going for us. We were in David. We had a conjugal visit, so we got to, we got to we got to have you know a, a sexual relationship a couple times a month, and and, uh, and she got to see we got to see each other every every week, and like I could arrange a special visit here and there, or you know, or arrange because of being who I was, I could arrange some things, and we could see each other three or four times a week, and 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 every two weeks having sex, um, having you know a sexual relationship, and now where I am now because of COVID, there's no there is there is conjugal visits here, but there's no no conjugal visits right now because of of COVID and, and, and my income is nothing. I mean, I don't have an income right now, which is really difficult because in the old prison through the corruption, I made quite a bit of money. Uh, even as a, even, a, even running the church, I made quite a bit of, you know, I, I make $1,500 a month so I can support a family on the outside. Now I make nothing uh, where I am now because of the situation. It's very difficult. Um, this is super max in the sense, in the, in the, in, and this is what I want to tell you about the way it works. I'm the pastor of the church here, and the police treat me very well. They do. They treat me very well. But their orders, they can't disobey their own their orders, their, their masters, you know, their boss. And, and, and the police are told to, that everybody here gets one hour out of their cell a day only. I get a lot more just because I'm the, the pastor, and I do the do church services. And anytime there's a problem, the, the police commissioner calls me and asks me to investigate what's going on, why the gang's angry, and so on and so forth. And I, I like that work. I feel like I'm doing something. You know, I'm giving something back. And, and and but 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 the the situation here is really difficult because this is where all the dang these are the murderers are all here and I'm not talking about murderers like a guy got got angry and killed his wife and that's something that guy's normal you know a, a guy a guy who gets angry and kills his wife or kills his wife's lover or something that's a normal guy that snapped and something will never happen again but I'm talking about people who you know who who got forty fifty homicides that's who that's who I live with I live with those guys you know gangbangers that they kill just because. Because that's what they do, man, and and so so it's 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 not an easy thing to run a church in a place like that. But these guys are so great and they're so wonderful, 
and and even though they they, they are difficult, they're they're wonderful, and they and they they embrace the church, and the church has really made a difference here. Um, when I came here, like I said, when I came here, there was a lot of suicides. We haven't had a single suicide, not one, since I started the church, and there were a lot of homicides. I mean, like a lot, like one a month. In a place that has 150 men, there's in, in an area that has 150 men, there's a one homicide a month. That's insane. I mean, like 10%, you know, or like 8%. Eight percent of all come in, come out in a box with a gun, with with with, with a bullet in them. You know, in a prison, in a supermax prison. So how is that even possible? But it is. So it is. It's still life here. So, but since we started the church in February of last year, 2020, not one homicide, not one. Well, there's one been one homicide. I'm lying. The one there was one. I told you the other day. Um, but not but not one suicide and one homicide in that time, that time period. So I'm really, I feel like I'm really doing something to give back. And, what I'm trying to do is get the heck out of here. I don't, I don't really feel like I need to be in this high level of security. As I said, I've lived in minimum security my whole existence in prison and never had a problem. Um, never had the, the reason they've moved me to maximum security was to punish me and to, and to shut me up, which obviously didn't work because here I am talking to you. So, Since being convicted or, or while you were on trial for that matter, did you ever run into any problems with anybody any gang members or cops or anything for that matter, getting in any type of altercations, whether it's stabbing or pulling guns or whatever it may be. The only thing I, only problem I, I don't really had any problem with any prisoners. Um, I'm, I fight a lot, and I mean boxing, and that tends to keep people at bay. Now, anybody, I want to be real clear about this. Anybody can kill anybody in prison. Let's, let's take an example. Somebody wants to kill Wild Bill. So they find a, a, a piedrero, a crackhead inside who has no money, no family. They send him a gun and say, we're going to give you a lifetime supply of drugs if you will kill Wild Bill. Wild Bill's dead, man. I mean, there ain't nothing I can do about it. He's going to kill me. So so really, the only reason I'm alive is because, is because of the grace and, and of Jesus Christ who loves me and, and, and takes care of me. And and. and and, and also, I know how to walk with prisoners very well. I respect everybody. I don't disrespect anybody. And when somebody disrespects me, amen, I let that walk, roll, roll right off my back. I don't worry about it. And this did happen to me when I first got put in prison in, in, in David. Like this first year, I was not, not the year when I, not the very first year, but the second year when they moved me to the, to the David facility. I was coming in from a, from a yard time, waiting on my cell, and a cop comes in. And I, these are custodians, not cops. The custod- and they're different. Cops are one thing. Cops are for like high profile and the custodians are for minimum security. The custodian came, he comes and he, I'm standing in front of my cell waiting to open the door. And he reaches into his belt and takes off his gas, his pepper spray, and sprays me in the face with it and laughs and opens the door. Well, I don't know, man. I'm from Western North Carolina and you, I don't know. Anyway, I took the gas away from him, took the stick away from him, beat the ever living shit out of him with the stick and, and emptied the gas can onto him. The other guards, the other guards saw this happening, screamed like little girls, and went running the other direction. So there's a camera there, and and the, the head guard is a friend of mine. He's a boss. The boss is a friend of mine. His name his name was Morales. Morales comes to the door and he's like, "You've got the guard. Uh, you're holding a guard hostage." And I said, "Here's the gas. Here's the stick. I ain't holding anybody hostage. I just beat the shit out of somebody that sprayed me in the face with gas. I want you to go and look onto the on the video and see what happened." So he comes and, and like and and like he leaves the cop there with me, the, the the custodian there, like screaming on the floor and clawing at his eyes, and and he goes and he goes back and he he looks at the video and he comes back and he's like, "You're right." And I'm like, "I just want to go to my cell. I don't want to cause any problem. I'm not looking to make a complaint, but ain't nobody going to hit me or ain't nobody going to just you know that's crazy, man. I didn't do anything wrong." And so after that, that story still is told within the prison system, and the guards are still very come on, like leery of. You know, but, but, but then there's no guard that would have any reason at all to harm me. I'm very respectful, and not all the guards are. You know that, that you get a lot of guys that, that, are, that are cops or that, that, come, that be prison guards because they like to be. I mean, like, here's the thing. You're going to be a prison guard. What is a prison guard? A prison guard is a person who puts another person in a cage for, for his work. My life's work is I like to put people in cages. That's a prison guard. So it attracts a certain kind of person who's a sadist to start with. And so not all of them are respectful and friendly and those you just have to ignore and do the best you can. And, and because the 90% of them are, are, are pretty nice guys really. And, and, and the line between prisoner and guard in the Republic of Panama is much more blurry than it would be in the United States. 
you know, in the States, you can't even talk to a prison guard or you're a rat. Here, like, you know, the prison, the prison guards are the ones that bring the contraband. So you've you got to talk to them. You know, you got to talk to and, and not only that, there's not such hatred between prisoner and guard. Like, I, I, and I say in the States, I've never been in prison in the States. And just what I've seen on TV or on documentaries. And so, but here, it's a lot, lot more like, it's not us versus them. It's, it's almost like us and us and us versus the government. So. I know we talked a little bit about uh, what what it's like living in there, but on an average day in the prison you're in now, what does it look like on an average day? You know, uh, what does your routine look like? Um, how are you treated? How are other inmates treated uh, that you see? Can you can you talk a little bit about that? I get up in the morning at about five. And uh, the water comes on here at five, six to seven. That's it, six to seven, and then again five to seven in the evening. You get two hours a day of water. I'm in a cell all by myself, which is a luxury, a big, a big luxury because there are there are two man cells, and and that's that's just that's just a perk of being a pastor here. So I get up at five and and I pray. I have a, a, a prayer routine that I do at five o'clock in the morning. I, I try to find God in the morning. If I can find God in the morning, He'll be with me all day. If I don't find Him in the morning, man, I'm a total asshole. I'm just being honest. So, so, so I find, I find God in the morning and I take a shower at six and wash my clothes, do all my other stuff at nine o'clock. And then, and then I like, I, I write my sermon, uh, or what I'm going to say, because I have three different prayer services every day. Actually, I'm missing a prayer service. I talked to the boys that I'm missing a prayer service right now to do the interview. Um, I have three prayer, prayer services that I have one at nine o'clock, one at, um, two o'clock and one at, at seven thirty. These are, these are done. The one at 7.30 is done from inside the cell. I scream, everybody, they got, and I have a, a scream. I call, I don't scream. I call and say, hey, we're going to, let's go, let's everybody be praying. So everybody turns the radios off, everybody turns the, the lights off, and we turn the TV off, and then and we do like a five-minute prayer service. But that I do 9 o'clock in the morning, uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and 7.30 at night. At 9 o'clock in the morning, I'm giving, that's my patio time, it's my exercise time. Now, the exercise time here is just in, in, the, in the patio in front of the cells inside inside that the, like you're looking at everybody's cells like i can go to anybody's cell and talk to them you know and 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 um and there's here there's in this side there's 20 cells and so there's like 40 people a little bit more and uh and so i go out and i run and i got like a couple other guys in the pay with me i run box a little bit there's a kid that i'm training and uh and we box a little bit we shadow we we spar a little bit and maybe do some push-ups and stuff and then i come back in at 10. i save water wash myself clean myself up pray again uh, write the next, write the next prayer service. I do that for, I do the nine o'clock prayer service outside at two o'clock. They let me out again for five minutes just to do a little prayer service back inside five o'clock Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at five o'clock. I do a complete church service an hour and a half, six, five, five to six or six thirty, depending on how long it runs. I preach for about 30 or 45 minutes in each one of those. And then, um, like seven o'clock prayer service and everything's locked down. So, I mean, it's, it's a pretty, you're living a pretty solo existence. I mean, it's not so much because like during the day, there's always somebody in the patio, you're always talking to somebody. And a lot of the guys, uh, it took a long time, but a lot of the guys, they trust me with their, their problems. And so they come and talk, I want to talk about asking advice, what to do about this and what to do about women. And, you know, most of 99% of the problems that we have to deal with are women on the outside. Because it's extremely difficult to live inside and have a woman on the outside. You got to have the right girl to be able to that'll be able to handle it. I got a really, really good girl. And she's terrible, terribly difficult. To be honest with you, she's terribly difficult, and I'm a terribly difficult man. Um, but we've made it work. We love each other very much, and and she's very trustworthy. Uh, I could give her a million dollars, and she wouldn't run away. Um, and she, I don't know what the hell she sees in me. She's beautiful. She could have anybody she wanted. But anyway, and and. Um, so, so our goal, she's studying to be a lawyer right now. And I'm kind of, I know I'm overlapping, but all this information is pertinent. She's studying to be a lawyer right now. So she's in the university. So and like, she wants to get me out of prison, which I think is possible. I, I don't think that I'll be here very much longer. I, I've always thought that I'd have to do 14 years. I don't know why there's an, there's an old Guns N' Roses song called 14 years. And even when I was a kid, when I was a little kid. I said, I'm going to do 14 years in prison. And I don't know, but it seems like that, that's, that's the case. And, and so. I don't know why I thought that. When I was like, I was like 11, 12 years old, that, that song was popular. Uh, you don't just step inside and do 14 years. That's the, that's the line out of the song. And I'm going to do 14 years in prison. What a stupid thing to say when you're a kid. I knew it. And here I am. So, um, so the life here is, is very solitary, but, but also it's not so solitary. And you really need other people here to get along. That's another thing I learned. No man's an island. You really need the guys to be able to survive here. Food is so hard, man. It's hard to eat here. You know, you get a food package in once a month. That's it. So you eat for two weeks and you starve for two weeks. And that's just how it is. 
so so like for instance, my wife will bring me one hundred eighty dollars worth of food. It's about what it costs. My super my my supermarket run costs about one hundred eighty dollars, and, uh, and 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 that that will last me about two weeks. And you live off cornflakes. If you don't like cornflakes, don't come here because you live cornflakes. You know, like right now, I'm eating cornflakes three times a day because there ain't nothing else. Um, and then, and then, and then I'm waiting until like the first of the month until I can bring in another food bank. Um, the life here is dangerous, it's extremely dangerous. If you're a foreigner and you're not wild bill that everybody's afraid of, if, if you're a foreigner and you come in here, the Panamanians will, will grab you and put a knife to your throat and tell you to call your family and tell them to, to transfer $20,000 or we're going to kill Billy Bob right now. Um, I, I've stopped that. Uh, that, that's been difficult to stop because it was a very, it's very lucrative for them, isn't it? And so, like, I, there's a Russian guy beside me, Norman, my good friend, he's like my little brother. I've been taking care of him now for almost a year. He's here. Uh, he's Estonian. We call him a Russian, but he's actually from Estonia. Which the, Estonia, Russia is the same thing. And um, he's here. He's wanted by by Interpol for something that happened in Estonia. And he's fighting, not trying not to go back. And so, so like, I take care of him. And then there's a Mexican guy upstairs, and I take care of the Mexican guy. So that the because the locals, like I say, the locals want to take advantage of those guys and and and, and like kidnap them in prison. If you understand. What I'm I know you spoke a little bit earlier about a uh, contraband but more out of out of mere curiosity uh what can you get in there i know you said guns and drugs so on and so forth what's the easiest thing to get and what's the hardest thing to acquire in there well i think i don't i don't know how they got ak-47s i don't know how they got smuggled in i don't know how you would do it now with the system they have in place now but there were i mean they did it they had it uh, guns are not hard to get at all. Um, they, what happens is somebody goes from outside the prison and throws it over the fence, or you pay a guard a thousand dollars to bring you one. Um, phones are difficult here. They were easier before, but they put scanners and stuff in here now. And, and like a phone is necessary. If you don't have a phone, man, you could, I, I lived nine months here one time without a phone. Nine months, man. I mean, you want to cut your own throat. You're really, really it's really hard. I mean, and, and what it does is makes you a slave. It makes you a slave of somebody who has a phone. Somebody said, "Well, I'm going to loan you a phone an hour a day, but you're going to wash my clothes." You know, and you're gonna clean my room and shit. And, and, and it's a humbling experience. Wild Bill, the great big, you know, the boss of bosses here cleaning somebody else's, washing somebody else's underwear because he wants to talk to his wife for an hour. I mean, hey, buddy, that's that's God working on me, man. You know, it's like sandpaper working on walking on the rough edges. So so you learn, you know, it, it trains you. This is this this experience. I've been in 17 months, 17, 18, 18 months now. I've been in this sector C. And I want you to know it's been the hardest thing in my whole life, but I'm not sorry. I know God sent me here for a reason to clean me up and to make me more humble, and it's worked. I'm not the I'm not the same man I was before I came in, and I have a different aspect on the things. And another thing, I'm, I think it's going to be really cool. The day that I get out of prison, and I, the the day that I get out of prison, and the, I can sit down on a couch and eat something, grab my wife by the hair of the head, and take her into the bedroom, make love to her, and go to sleep. I am going to feel like the king of Earth. I mean, and that's such a mundane thing that everybody else in the whole world can do, but to take it for granted, you know, like you take it, well, that's just what you do, right? You know, oh yeah, I'm going to get something, I'm going to go eat green McDonald's and, 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 and go screw. And, you know, that's kind of vulgar, but, but I'm saying, and, and that's just something that, that, that everybody does, but, but like, I don't get to do that, man. And, and like a McDonald's hamburger and four hours of sex with my wife would be like, I'd be like, man, it's just incredible. You know, it'd be such a, such a, be so thankful for that, and, and and like I wasn't before. I wasn't. I, w- I wasn't even when I was in prison in David and in in and in, in Chiriqui, those two prisons I was in before I was here. Uh, sex was easy for me there as well because I worked with I worked with the girls out of the office, and and we're in Panama, man, and it ain't the same culture as in the states. And so, so I won't really expand on that, but 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 like where I am now, there is no. Because of COVID, there's no outlet for your sexual desire at all. And so that's really difficult. It's like the States. I don't understand how the United States r- runs a prison without giving conjugal visits. That's just like asking people to be homosexuals. I, I don't understand. I don't understand well, what what are they trying to achieve by doing that? I mean, like prisoners are so much like here, you, you're you going to behave yourself because you don't want to lose your conjugal visit because if you screw up and you hit somebody or you, you hit a guard or something. They take away your conjugal visit, and man, I mean, you know, you you got to see, you got to see mommy. You know what I mean? You want to see the, you want to see your old lady, and so, so I think that it's really, it should be a human right, man. Even even in this hell where I am here, because of COVID, there aren't, but but before COVID, there was, and and so, and there will be again after COVID. So uh, contraband, 
anything and everything that you can get. You can't dream. Of, you could probably get a tank if you could pay for it. You know, if you had enough money. Um, most of the most of the most of ninety percent of the the contraband inside a prison here: knives, guns, telephones. That's some of the majority. Drugs, drugs, drugs is ninety percent of it. Ninety percent is drugs because drugs here are so cheap, like and uh, and it's such a such a perdition for the kids here, and because like a gram of cocaine, this pure, 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 pure cocaine, a gram here is like ten bucks inside, like five bucks outside. So cheap, and and the problem is that that you get kids that like have their their visit, and they sell all their food to buy cocaine, and it's just sad. If if there could be a way to keep drugs out of a prison, maybe some of them productive would happen. But the the problem is that the prison authorities love. That there are drugs here. Oh, they want to fill the prison with, with marijuana and cocaine. Why? Because they don't have to do anything for us. Everybody's occupied high. And so if, if you took away all the drugs, they'd have to find work programs and stuff like that to, to occupy our time. But right now, they don't have to do anything. They just, throw, they just look the other way when some cop brings a kilo of, of, of Colombian Bam Bam in here. And then all the kids are busy for, you know, two weeks doing the drugs. It's really sad. Um, from what you've been telling me, that prison there is pretty hardcore and intense. And if, if if you're not on your toes, you know, you'll probably become a victim. How are inmates such as, you know, child killers or child rapists treated there? Are they housed in PC or, or are they just the first ones to go? The child molesters here die. And I'll be perfectly honest with you, I got no problem with that. And like we had one in David, we had one that came in and, and, and the, the boss man told me, Said, hey, we got a guy coming in here that's, um, you know, he's on, he's for, for molesting children. And so, like, where can you house him? I'm like, I don't know, man, in a grave because there's nowhere. If I can't wait, can you put him somewhere? Where am I going to put him? Where am I going to put him? They didn't kill him. They don't kill him. And they killed him. And so, and there's not a whole lot, not a whole lot of sympathy. I mean, as a Christian, I have to love everybody. But it's difficult to find sympathy for someone who would harm a child, like a small child. You know what I'm saying? Like, you see, say, well, you killed a kid. I killed a 17 year old kid who was in the mafia. <laughs> so, yeah, that's true. But but we're talking about a little kid or a little girl, you know, and somebody's raping them and stuff, man. Nobody has a whole lot of temp- patience for that here. And they die really ugly, too, normally. Uh, when I saw one one time, and they. They like they had broom handles and they they beat him and, and like was were penetrating his, his his rear end with a with a with a with a broom handle and stone you know it was just an ugly thing he died really ugly and and um, that's not right it's not right but at the same time I don't know I don't I, I try not to get involved and, and and that's that's not maybe not the right attitude but. And maybe as a Christian, I should be more sympathetic in uh, of that. But it's difficult for me to have sympathy for someone who would kill a, kill or harm a small child like that. I, I don't think that, I mean, if you read the Bible, our religion doesn't treat kindly anybody who would do that. And so so maybe that's the deterrent, isn't it? You know, maybe that's that's part of the deterrent. So when a murder or attempted murder or, or a brutal assault, for that matter, happens inmate to inmate, What's the process of that? Do they investigate it? Uh, and if they if they find out who did it, do they uh, convict them, or is it just like eh, whatever? It's more like they have they do a paperwork. They do paperwork, and I want you to know something about Panama. Panama is a crazy place, man. The United States of America, I checked, has about a sixty percent homicide resolve rate, meaning forty percent of homicides go unresolved. And this is the country that has the best CSI in the world. Um, Europe is the same. England, England, 60, 62% homicide resolve rate. The Republic of Panama has a 99% resolve rate. How is that possible? Because they just put a crime with a body. Oh, you did this. No, but I didn't. But yes, you did. And there's no... And if you ain't got money, then how are you going to fight it? You're going down. And so a lot, a lot of guys here you know, are lost. But 50 years is the most you can spend in prison in Panama, but they can... like. Let's say you got, they give you a 50 year sentence, you do five years, you, now you got 45 years to go and you kill somebody. Well, you start over at 50 again, now you're starting from 50. You got a lot of these kids that what they do for a living is they kill people, that's their job. And it's not even like they're, they're not even that ugly about it or anything. It's just not like even that violent about it. It's just that like the rival, this, this gang member wants to kill that gang, wants, wants to kill somebody. So they say, say to the kid that has 50 years, 
kill him, and we'll send your family a thousand dollars, and you'll have drugs for six months. What's the kid got? He's already got fifty years. He, you can't live fifty years in a Panamanian prison. I mean, you'll get sick and die. There's no way. No one, nobody's ever going to complete a fifty-year sentence here. That's a that's a that's a that's a death sentence. Like they gave me a forty-six-year sentence. I'm really well aware. If I don't do something about it, nobody could live forty-six years in a Panamanian prison. You'll die. You know, no food, no health care. No, I mean. Here you get sick, you die, man. There's no health care. Health care? I had a heart attack in February, in February of last year. But it wasn't a heart attack. What it actually was was a dehydration to the point in which my blood became so thick that my heart could not pump it. And I, I was working out too much and not drinking enough water and not taking care of myself very well. And, and so I fell in the floor, literally. Blap, I was running and fell, blap, in the floor. And uh, and they they actually took me to the doctor. Um, me being a high profile case, they actually took me to the doctor. The doctor said, "You've had a heart attack, but give me a urine sample." I gave him a urine sample. And he says, "This looks like this looks like motor oil." I said, "That's what's wrong with you." So drink water. And that was my heart attack. Yeah, that was what they did for heart attack. And it took me about two weeks to get over. About two weeks to get back to normal. So a normal kid, like a kid, had a seizure here one time. They don't do nothing. They just wait until he's done. They stick him back in a cell. You know, there's no and, and like and you're talking about what happened. What's the process? of a homicide that happens here. First they come, lock everybody down. Then they ask if anybody wants to rat. Nobody's going to rat. And then then they bring in two or three months later, they bring in a couple of investigators to ask some questions. The investigators play Russian roulette and say, this Billy Bob did it, Juan did it, or you know, whoever, somebody did it. And they play Russian roulette, and, and it's they're never right. Or like one Russian roulette, one time out of six, they're right. And and then they give them another homicide case, and the kids don't really care. You get 50 years, and they give you another homicide, you don't care. I know that you said there's no rehabilitation in that prison whatsoever, but do they offer any type of classes or even college courses, or can you get your GED in there or anything like that? Another, in another prison, there are. There, there, there's, there's, there, there, you, can, you, can do, you can do an actual high school thing, an actual high school, like the prison I was in in Chiriki. It's very good. But here in this prison, which is like the place that they need more rehabilitation, there is absolutely nothing. I mean, nothing, no type of nothing, 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 no, no job, no study, no nothing. I invented the church program, it's something I did myself, and I had to scratch tooth and claw, tooth and nail to, to get them to allow me to do it. Now they love it. The cops love it because it's less work for them, you know. And then and also they show me off like, oh, look, we have a, we have a, we have a gringo that's our preacher here, and they're all, you know, this wild bill is our preacher here, you know, they love it. But but it was hard to even get that going. A normal person couldn't even do that. And so so it's it's really a hopeless situation. Sector C in La Nueva Hoya, it's, it's just hopeless, the hopeless situation. There's 150 men here. It's the worst situation in Panama's prison system. Before we conclude this interview, is there anything that you would like to talk about that we haven't covered yet? Yeah, there is something. I want to, a couple of things. One, um, there was a guy named, I can't think of his name. Um, a guy wrote a book about me called the Jolly Roger Social Club. And the Jolly Roger Social Club was a bar that I owned in Bocas. I, I owned a bar in 2008, 2007. And this guy uh, was is an English fellow. He came to see me in prison and asked me for an interview and said he was going to write a book about me. And I said, well, I'll do it, but I want you to give me $10,000, which I thought was a very small amount of money. Um, and he said that he felt that it wouldn't be ethical for him to pay me uh, because I'm a murderer. And I said, and I said to him, I'm like, well, that's a bit of a hypocrite because you're going to make a million dollars off of it, right? You can make money off of it, but I can't. And so I got to suffer. So I went back to my cell and that was it. My lawyer brought the, the man here. Then. He writes a book in which he says that he had this long interview with me and and that I bragged about all the evil things I'd done and that, that I had and that, that I had come out with a wooden cross, uh, like blessing everybody with a wooden cross. I don't know, just a whole bunch of madness. I mean, like things that just didn't happen and and it, it was heartbreaking because like, man, and, and this idiot made a whole lot of money off of this thing that wasn't even true. Uh, and then, and I didn't read the book. I won't read it. I refuse to read it. But some of my friends did said it was just like such a fantasy uh, and such a bunch of bullshit. Um, that, and it's really sad. It made me sad that, 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 that journalists can do that sort of thing. And, and I've had a really hard time with journalists. I've not had a really good run with it. Now, I'm making a movie right now, a documentary film, excuse me, uh, with the permission of, of the prison system from with a, with a guy with uh, Parrot Films. 
uh, which is a, is, a, is a company that sells movies like HBO and Netflix and so on. So documentaries, not movies, not movies, a documentary. And so we've been making it for two years. I, I've already did my part a long time ago. I did my part in 2019, but they've made the documentary. And I haven't even seen it yet. I don't even know how it is, but it should be out later this year, like December of this year, let's hope. And, and, and I finally got to tell my side of the story. And we hope that it's going to be fairly big. And, and I, I'd like people to understand. The thing that I would, I would like for somebody to understand here is that that if there's hope in Jesus Christ for a, a monster like Wild Bill, who is now Brother William, um, there's there's hope for anybody. And I know that this audience that's listening, I'm really aware that the audience that's listening to this is not a Christian audience. And that's good because the Christian the Christian audience hates me. They, they, they don't like me. Um, you want the truth. I'm a Christian, right? I'm a preacher in a church, but the actual Christian audience has not been very favorable to me because... Most Christians like to think of prisoners as suffering and not doing anything very well. And, and it's a shame that what most Christians are is not what Christ was or is. Um, but I think that the, the whole point of my life from this point on is to spread the love of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is about love, right? He's not, not a, there's nothing about hate in Jesus Christ. And yet you get a lot of hatred out of a lot of a lot of Christians, and, and that's a sh- that's a sad thing. And I don't want to curse Christians. There's a lot of good Christians in the United States. There's a lot of good Christians in the world. I've been benefit. I've been I've been benefited by knowing a lot of excellent Christians here, and who are just all about love. But but the thing about it is, Jesus Christ is love, and 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 we we got to help each other. He, Jesus Christ only ever gave us two commandments: two, love God above everything else, and love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the only two commandments Christ, that Jesus Christ ever gave us. And so he said that the law would be would be completed in these two in these two statements. If you love God above everything else, love your love your neighbor as yourself. And loving your neighbor as yourself is a very hard thing to do. It's a very hard thing to do. But the more that you do it, the better your life will be. I have a great life, and that pisses a lot of people off. It makes a lot of people angry that I'm in prison and I'm not suffering. I'm not suffering at all. I mean, I live in a way which would make you suffer if you came to live my life one day. You say, "How do you live that horrible life?" And sweat and, and in that place with those horrible people and I wake up every day with this great big stupid smile on my face just as happy as I can be and I feel like that I'm just having I'm just having a, I'm just in the circus having a big old time here because I try all I do all day long is serve other people I don't I don't I don't, I, don't, I try not to serve myself I, I serve other people all day long because that's what Jesus Christ did Jesus Christ washed the feet of his own disciples so like I'm here I am given a spill a spill of, of Christianity to a the people who, who like serial killers and who like to, to hear about stuff like that. But but these are the people who need to be helped, who need to be reached. And how is some dude in a little bitty Baptist church, I'm a Baptist, I am a Baptist, but how is some dude in a little bitty Baptist church in the mountains of Western North Carolina or, or in, in Kansas somewhere or in Texas, how is he going to reach some guy that identifies with, with, with Satan worship or that identifies with the Gothic culture? How is he going to reach that guy? It's not going to happen. They can't understand each other. A couple of ladies from Texas go to, this is fictitious, didn't happen. But a couple of ladies from Texas go to to a Maryland Man- Manson concert and start telling people that Jesus loves them. The Maryland Manson people are going to be like, those two ladies are crazy. And the two ladies are going to be like, them Maryland Manson people are crazy. They can't understand one another. Hey, I'm a murderer, man. I mean, I live in the closest thing to hell on earth. You can listen to me. I'm going to, tell, I'm going to give you the straight dope, man. You know, anybody, people are interested in me. Jesus Christ loves you, man. And, and, and he wants to, he wants to make you happy as I am right now. So I guess that's my, that's the, the, the last thing that I'd like to say. And if you have any other questions, I'd be glad to answer. Them. I would like to give everybody a way to get in contact with me also, or to see what I'm about. We have a YouTube channel called Army of Christ Panama. And that's, uh, that's my ministry, Army of Christ Panama. Uh, you can go on YouTube and look it up, Army of Christ Panama. And also on Facebook, I just, uh, there's just a, my family opened up a new group that you guys can get in touch with me at. It's called Friends of Brother Bill Halber. Friends of Brother Bill Halber. And that's who I am. So, so you guys come and check me out. And anybody that would like to get in touch with me, I'd just love to talk to anybody and everybody. I appreciate it. If you, if you hate me, don't talk to me. I don't want to talk to anybody that hates me because I love everybody. Even if you hate me, I love you. So, so, but don't talk. I'm not asking for people to give me a hate mail, but if, if you're interested in, in, in saying, Hey, or you'd like to ask anything or please, by all means, get in contact, man. I'm really happy to talk to anybody. So that's on Facebook. That's friends of brother Bill Halbert. And then on YouTube, that's army of Christ Panama. So thanks so much. 
That was my interview with convicted serial killer William Holbert. Thank you for listening. I'm